everybody we're just going to wait as a few more people file in and then we'll get the conversation today started Okay, well, I think that we'll get going um, as, as additional people continue to join. Um, welcome and thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Yvonne Altman. I'm the co-executive director of The Bentway. And I wanna thank you for joining us for part two of our two-part series, Exploring Play and Urban Recovery. Um, this series is part of a summer long inquiry called Playing in Public that explores the history and future of play and its role in shaping decisions about our cities and our public spaces. And we've been extremely fortunate to collaborate with numerous artists and educators, athletes and urbanists on this initiative, which includes a neighborhood exhibition, a series of urban experiments, online experiences, and of course, important conversations like the one that we will have here today. As an organization that's dedicated to the creation of shared and inclusive space, I'd like to start by acknowledging that our work takes place on the lands of the Mississauga of the Credit and the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and many other Indigenous nations. We meet here today on a virtual platform, and so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the lands where, which we each call home and the important relationship between place and people. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility to improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their culture. I'm really pleased to be welcoming Alex Bezikovic as the moderator of today's discussion. Alex is the Globe and Mail's architectural critic. He writes about architecture, heritage, planning, and landscape, both here in Toronto and beyond. He's the co-author of Toronto Architecture, a City Guide, and the co-editor of House Divided, which was shortlisted for the Speaker's Book Award of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario. He was also awarded the 2009 President's Medal for Media and Architecture from the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, for his journalism and won the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario's 2017 Media Award. Thank you very much for joining us today, Alex. Uh, thanks so much, Elena. Thanks for having me. Uh, and thank you for reading that probably excessively long bio. Uh, I apologize. Um, <laughs> Not at all. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here today with uh, a fantastic panel um, to talk about the subject of play um, as a means of recovery. So, before we get into our discussion, I wanted to start by going around the room and giving everyone a chance to introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about how their work intersects with the theme of our discussion today. So um, Alexander, if you don't mind kicking us off, um, can you introduce yourself please and uh, tell us a little bit about um, where we might go with the uh, play? Sure. Um, thanks so much for having me. This is really a great panel and I'm happy to be part of it. Um, so I'm a journalist and a critic and my book, The Design of Childhood, How the Material World Shapes Independent Kids, came out in 2018. Um, so as a journalist, I often write about things and then kind of move on from the topic. Um, but in fact, the question of children in cities and what they need from the built environment and how to keep them safe, how families are represented in planning policy has become a really ongoing theme in my work. Um, and all of the stories that I've written most recently during the pandemic um, have also touched on children in public space in some way. Um, I mostly write for Sid Curbed and Bloomberg City Lab. Um, and those stories have included um, where children are playing online during the pandemic, mostly spaces like Discord and Roblox, um, how time can be used as a design tool um, as it's been used in hybrid or blended learning, putting you know, half the number of kids in a classroom at a time, 
Or um, last winter, I wrote about embracing winter, um, inspired by a lot of Canadian examples, um, talking about bundling up your kids and taking them outside to skate or go birding or get cocoa when outdoors was the safest place to gather. So I feel like all of the themes that were in my book have actually um, given me a lot of jumping off points to think about the pandemic and what comes after. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and as I was just saying off camera, I am, uh, this is not at all artificial, but I actually have this book on my desk right now. Uh, I'm working with it as part of a, um, a project I'm researching now, and it is a fantastic book. I recommend it highly. Um, moving around the room, uh, Mitchell, can you tell us a little bit about you and your work and play? Hi, I'm uh, Mitchell F. Chan. Uh, I'm an artist and I'm the co-founder of Studio F Minus, a public art collaborative. I uh, created one of the artworks in the Bentways play season titled Nil Nil. Um, when I was approached to do this work, I had the unique opportunity of being able to start the ideation process for this artwork while the pandemic was going on. And so this artwork became a thesis on what play would mean, um, particularly for children, at a time when our physical public spaces were shut down and interaction and play had moved into digital public spaces. And I wanted to think about the ways that, you know, those digital spaces connect people, but also a way that they make the real separation between us feel completely impassable. Uh, and so Nil Nil uh, at the Bentway is a portrait of play uh, in the pandemic. Which we are looking at right now, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I wasn't sure if everyone could see that. I thought I was just queuing it up for my little, my little spiel. And uh, it's fantastic. Maybe you should, uh, if you don't mind, you, you want to just take a second to explain how it works? Um, sure. So um, Nil Nil uh, is a large scale installation piece. Um, and what you're seeing, if you can't tell the scale, those kids that you're seeing um, on the screens are life size. So each of those phones is about seven feet. And so this uh, particular photo only shows half the sculpture. It's about 60 feet long. And in these two soccer nets, um, there are two phones uh, suspended from each soccer net and a sort of um, like medical, medically sealed tube uh, that connects them. And there's a real soccer ball and it bounces back and forth. And as the ball arrives in front of one child, their virtual avatar kicks it and it moves across the field. And in this way, these children are playing with each other online. Um, and the first experience of the work is sort of funny. It's, it's neat, it's a neat, yeah, it's neat that technology can do this, isn't it? Um, but I think on further reflection, we realize that what we're seeing is a distance that can never be bridged as long as these children are restricted to their devices. Um, and what we're seeing is a game they're playing where the score will remain nil nil forever. Um, and there are there are going to be no no winners here. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Um, let's go over to Adel. Adel. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, I guess about Camp Reset? Yes, and uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, my name is Ado Dalla. I am the uh, Director of Community for Reset. And uh, Reset is a nonprofit social enterprise. Uh, we founded, we were founded in 2015. And um, for the last five years, pre-pandemic, we had been organizing uh, overnight adult summer camps, which were centered around play and digital detoxing. And uh, of course, last year we were unable to host our camp uh, but what we decided to do this year was to bring our programming directly into the city, uh, very appropriately for this conversation, as a means to kind of contribute towards the social recovery. And we took one of our most successful play-based activities from camp uh, and tailored it to, to be done in a socially distanced, uh, open-air way uh, within different parks and public spaces within uh, Toronto. Uh, and we've now hosted 46 playgrounds across the city, uh, over the last six weeks. In fact, actually just this past weekend, we hosted a handful uh, at the Bent Way, uh, which was just the most incredible setting and very appropriate place for us to be. Uh, but we've done it. Uh, we've done it in parks, in courtyards, in alleyways. Uh, we've been really trying to spark uh, one sense of imagination around where we can play. And in terms of where we go after the playgrounds, our, our plans are, are to open up a physical space dedicated to play in the city. Um, so we've got a good roadmap ahead of us. And 
I'll just kind of note too, uh, as an organization, our mission is to inspire people to just play. And just play is um, the learning we've had over the last five years, especially one being as adults, uh, we tend to lack a sense of permission around play. So just play is a very clear directive. Um, but also um, we've learned that it is really hard to have collective joy without justice. So just play is justice and play and uh, everything we do from the playgrounds this summer to our camps and beyond is informed by these two pillars. And so that's who we are in the work that we do. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, and let us uh, finishing going around the room. Uh, Tim, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, speak to this theme a little bit? Sure. Hi. Uh, so I'm uh, an independent scholar and writer and um, uh, a global advocate for children's outdoor play and mobility. Um, my book, since we're on the topic of books that came out, my book, Urban Playground, How Child-Friendly Planning and Design Can Save Cities, came out earlier this year. Um, I've come through the sort of NGO and campaigning world. And um, so I'm, I'm interested in children's changing relationship with the people and places around them. And I did just want to show one image that I think helps to get a historical perspective on this. So I'm just hoping the technology is going to uh, work with me and I'm hoping that you can all see a map is, is that uh, yep yeah. um, and what you can see here is a a map that shows you what you might call the roaming range or the kind of home territory of four children they're all eight years old but they're in four generations of the same family and obviously they all lived in the same city and so that that big blob that you can see that takes up most of the map uh, is is the roaming range of the great grandfather in this uh, family at the age of eight he could go 10 kilometers, six miles across the city. And then you can see how the, the, the circles shrink with each generation until we get to the sun. Uh, here we go up here, the yellow dot. And uh, most of my work is about reflecting on and responding to this change, which I think is a fundamental and, and underexplored change in the nature of childhood. And I mean, it's, it's a starting off point for a conversation. It's not an invitation to just indulge in pointless nostalgia, but I think we, it, 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 you know, we need to reflect on what this change means. And, and when we come to just think about the pandemic, I think uh, one of the things that, that, that I believe is that, that um, the experience of lockdown is actually just a sort of speeded up version of what's been happening to successive generations of children over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Um, and again, I think that's, a, that's an interesting um, way to invite a conversation about what it might now mean uh, for children to have lived through lockdown, for adults to have lived through lockdown, and um, uh, shines a light on the importance of play and mobility as we emerge from the pandemic. Thank you. I think that's a really interesting provocation. Um, you know, and I just want to emphasize um, you know, the, the phenomenon you're talking about is very much true in North America, even for those of us who are young enough to have grown up in the suburbs, as I mostly did myself. I'm in my 40s. And, you know, the amount of freedom that was available to me when I was as young as five and six, um, you know, seems unimaginable now, even for children who are considerably older than that. Um, yeah. It's actually a global story as well. I've, I've got uh, maps just like this from Dublin, um, from a town in Belgium, uh, from a town in Sweden. I'm happy to hear of others, but, but you know, the, yeah, this is uh, a, a pretty global experience. Indeed. And some of us, I know Alexander and I as parents are both pushing back against this as best we can, but it, it, is, uh, it is very powerful. Um, so let's get on to our main discussion and onto the topic. So to start with, um, let's sort of define our terms. When we talk about play, uh, what are we talking about? Um, for you, how do you define play? Or for the creators in the group, how do you, uh, what role does play play within your work? Um, can we start back at the beginning again? Alexander? Um, well, I'm not a creator per se, but um, I really see play as the baseline activity for creativity, like of whatever age group, um, just the idea, and this happens in writing too, putting things together, starting from scratch, trying things out, and whether that's words or a pile of wood scraps or junk, um, I think adults and children, whether they think of themselves as creative or not, need undefined time and space to let their thoughts and their bodies roam. 
Um, because without that time, we become locked into patterns of kind of productivity and assessment and quantification that are ultimately really anti-social and anti-community and anti-creative. Thank you. Uh, who was next? Was uh, Mitchell next? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I, I really would like to build on what Alexandra was saying and talking, you know, about play as, you know, non-designated time, right? Um, play it, to me is, it could almost be synonymous with art um, in that, you know, art making and play are both activities where I believe that one should enter without like uh, any explicit intention for a productive outcome, right? Um, and one of, um, right, like it, it, it's, it's time, it's activity that will not be instrumentalized to any end except for its own realization, um, which is really great. It's also increasingly feeling impossible possible um, these days, right? Um, as we've managed to sort of, um, you know, commodify and instrumentalize play, um, right, as something that we can do better. We can, we can play better and in ways that burn more calories, right? And, 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 in, and in ways that will, you know, you know uh, uh, be better for, for, for my well-being. And in the ways that we also increasingly gamify our work to make it feel uh, like it's not work. Um, and so what is play? Um, ideally, uh, yes, it is activity without the expectation of immediate return. Um, however, increasingly it becomes a strategy, um, a sort of um, uh, 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 a Trojan horse that gets attached to work and labor. Indeed. Uh, and I am guilty of that phenomenon, even my, in my own uh, personal life, unprompted. Um, these trends are hard to escape. Um, Adel, what is play? Why should we do it? I, I love those first two answers. Um, I would, um, and I, I think I'll probably echo on them. You know, for me, play is something which is intrinsically motivated, uh, an intrinsically motivated action, uh, which we do for the pursuit of joy. Um, so the other way that I also think about it, and I think this is kind of a uh, same way of saying it, but a different angle to, to what Mitchell was just sharing, is I think a lot about play as an access point to our freedom. And, and this might be because um, I often think about play solely from the uh, experience of play in adults. But when I think about my experience with play, it's when I'm free from work, free from worries, free from, from even uh, elements of my identities. Um, and there's very few things that allow me to kind of uh, transcend a, a bunch of these things which have become the dominant part of my adult experience. Um, and so, uh, so play, play is essentially a portal into um, uh, parts of my life which uh, are often uh, hard to, to do. And I think to, kind of to Mitchell's point too about um, the co-opting, the commodification, even the competitive uh, um, uh, elements of play, um, you know, we, we as adults tend, uh, we tend to, to take things that are very simple and, and, and make them quite complicated. And so I, I'll just wrap by saying, I think play can literally be defined as an activity that we do for our fun, fulfillment, and freedom. Sorry, I, I was on mute. Uh, Tim, what does play mean now? Right. What does it matter? Okay, so I, I'm gonna build on Adol's remarks, which actually uh, uh, neatly encapsulate some ideas about play from play work, this sort of tradition, interesting tradition of people who work alongside children at their play and I, I, I I'm going to suggest there is something distinctive and different about play as manifested by children mm -hmm. um, uh, which is a kind of unconscious or unselfconscious almost you know that it's an urge or an itch in children in a way that is I, I think not rarely the case with adults children just can't help themselves um, when they play and there's also uh, it, whatever the kind of medium or activity on the surface, if you go a bit beneath that with children and young people, I think what what you see is an an emotional dimension to children's play, that that they're um, kind of toying with their own emotional regulation. Um, uh, the the, the um, Norwegian researcher Helen Sandsetter, who's written a lot about risky play, she talks about the sort of scary funny aspect of, you know, the sort of butterflies in the stomach. Now, it's not always there, but it, there's a kind of significant thread through children's play around risk, uncertainty, um, and, and getting slightly outside of one's comfort zone. And 
obviously see resonances with with adult creativity but 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 also that um you know they just can't help themselves <laughs> um uh children and, and and even though with young people it can become more sort of sociable and maybe a bit more self-conscious i think there's still that quality of of um being slightly sort of bursting out of us that that, that I, I i want to hold on to and it uh, also speaks to its importance in giving us a sense of who we are and a, particularly of our kind of competencies and our you know what engages us and and our ability to navigate the world oh, thank you for that um i want to take this um sort of uh, to a place that i think you know will sort of build on a little bit of what you were saying to try and connect uh, the idea of play with the physical city. Um, and I think um, the most logical place to begin is to think about how places that are designed for play, for children's play, have changed. So maybe we can start with a bit of a history of that. Alexander, do you mind walking us through how um, the types of places that are designated for play have evolved over the last couple of generations? Sorry, I was muted. Um, and this ties in well to the, um, the sort of map that Tim shared earlier. But one of the ironies that I talk about in my book is that at least in the US and Canada, um, playgrounds spread really rapidly in the early 20th century. Um, and that initially seems like a good thing, you know, play provision, safety, and public investment in good, healthy childhoods. But at the same time, setting aside spaces for children really robbed those children of their right to the city, of their right to roam, as we saw in that map. Um, because adults began to see that they didn't have to make room for children elsewhere. Um, and over time, the definition of where it was safe to play, how it was safe to play, what play was appropriate, all of that um, became defined as um, something that should not disrupt adult activities like driving or socializing after dark or making a mess. And so the areas set aside for children just became narrower and narrower. Um, and I guess we could, I could just say that we see the effects of this during the pandemic where um, against you know, what the science uh, later showed, like cities initially shut down playgrounds as places where children gathered. Right. Um, and with playgrounds and schoolyards and schools shut down, there was literally like no place for kids to go mm -hmm. um, because we had defined them out of the rest of the city. Right. right. So the realm of play had been so circumscribed that uh, suddenly with these few refuges gone, there was, there was nothing left. Huh. Exactly. exactly. Huh. Interesting. Uh, Tim, uh, what about, um, can you talk about the, would you like to build on that at all and talk about how sure. the design of play spaces has changed? Yeah, I mean, Alex is absolutely right, but I, I think I, I, I taking a, a, a sort of urban planning and, and if you like the kind of politics of urban planning, um, certainly in, in Europe and North America, you could almost say that the history of urban planning has been of a kind of battle between children on the one hand and, and car drivers, car owners and drivers on the other. Um, and for, for, the, for the vast majority of this century, you know, the, or the last hundred years, children have lost. Um, it's, it's now at a, at a more interesting point, but, but the, the playgrounds were originally designed as, exactly as Alex says, as kind of safe refuges, but crucially safe from the threat from traffic. Um, and they were also actually places that were, were where uh, working class kids were sort of humanized and you know and and, and um where the, the evil influences of the street were were kind of removed from children's lives so so there's a uh the, the sort of power demand the story of, of 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 play in cities is really about children's loss of power and and um and and their their lives being kind of subjugated to those of adults um and i think that that um we we still we see that sort of just beginning, and I think the pandemic is going to be interesting uh, around this to 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 see real reflection about almost you know there's a how far do you take that how, how much do you squeeze out the spaces and the time for children to play um, before we see real um, you know not just problems in in terms of children but a kind of loss of humanity in our communities and I think that's that's one of the questions I'm hoping that is coming into focus as we come out of the pandemic. Interesting. Um, I've also noticed during the pandemic, as I'm sure we all have, that um, different kinds of public life 
let's say to use young Gale's term, um, some of which could be defined as play and some, some might not, um, have taken over places where they hadn't been before. I mean, obviously in big cities, we've seen, you know, the slow streets or quiet streets, the pedestrianization of um, otherwise car oriented public space. Um, do we feel that that is a meaningful trend that has real implications for how our public spaces could function or for a different um, political understanding perhaps of what public space is for? Anyone? Well, I'd suggest that some of the slowing down of these streets um, and the trend towards making them more um, pedestrian friendly as opposed to motorist friendly mm -hmm. um, has nothing to do with a, an attempt in earnest to create playful spaces and everything to do with facilitating like commercialization, like with facilitating the economy. And these are still not play spaces, right? All of the streets where I live, where now parking spaces are converted into patios, still dicey propositions for taking your kids, right? They exist so that we can spend some money at these local businesses, which is great. Big, big, big fan of my local businesses, happy that they have patios, but unfortunate, and, and I do hope that that trend continues, but I do not believe it addresses a, 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 at all the issues that, that we're talking about here. Interesting. Um, anyone else? I mean, I'm, I'm gonna suggest that, that where these questions need to go is uh, is a, is around not our response to the pandemic but our response to the climate crisis mm -hmm. um and and and, and that, that here in, in london where i'm speaking to you from we did see some interesting interventions around streets uh, low traffic neighborhoods school streets they were not driven by a kind of economic imperative they were driven by um a sense that there was a, there was a, a sort of moment of possibility where uh, car use was falling, I mean, plummeted, yeah. um, where public transport was problematic yeah. and where, um, you know, a kind of low cost interventions to make it easier for people to walk and cycle locally yeah. could be put in place. Um, and, you know, the, the, the dream was that, that, that we would all realise how much better our neighbourhoods would be uh, as you know, when we take away uh, a lot of through traffic, and in some places that's happened, mm -hmm. in other places it's proved more controversial. Um, but I think you know, I, 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 I see no future in cities that does not involve massive shift away from car use, um, and and uh, and I think that, uh, and I know the debate is in a different place in North America. I think compared to to Europe. But it's still, you know, it ain't going away, and so uh, I think it's incumbent upon any of us who who want to see progressive change in cities to bring in some uh, insights and arguments about how we're going to need to to adapt cities uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. I think that's a, an excellent connection to make. Uh, and I think you're right that the conversation in North America is rather different than the one in Europe. Um, but the places where you have the, the best sort of um, play in streets, uh, I would say, from what I have witnessed, are, I mean, really, it's New York, right? I mean, you know, I have a good friend in Brooklyn who's sending me videos of um, the, essentially, the street fair on Vanderbilt Avenue uh, every weekend, which, you know, has the atmosphere of a carnival. Right. I mean, you have a major street which has commercial activity, but also, you know, has really vibrant public life because you have a lot of people uh, who are, you know, taking advantage of the opportunity to um, see that balance shifted away from cars and towards other kinds of activity. So why don't we, um, I wonder if others share the view that Mitchell expressed that the sort of commercialization or the, um, the reorganization of public space for commercial purposes is in tension with play. I mean, are those the same thing or can they be, can they work in tandem? Well, if I can just speak to the New York example, um, I mean, I think the, the Vanderbilt open street is actually a good example of a place where um, the kind of open restaurants programs and um, an open streets kind of freestyle <laughs> um, program have come together. Right. But I agree with him that that is not in general the case. Like in general, like the, the media coverage and indeed like the spatial coverage has really focused on businesses and not kind of focused on everybody else. Um, and as somebody who doesn't go to restaurants that often, I just, it's like, it's great to see, but it's not something that has actually affected my life. Whereas if 
um, in my neighborhood, more streets had just been opened up for community activities without the commercial factor, that would have been different. Mm -hmm. and, and New York has several examples of open streets. Um, there's Vanderbilt Avenue in Brooklyn, um, there's 31st and 34th Street in Queens, and there's also quite a, a large um, area on the Lower East Side. And like with all of those, um, what all of those streets have in common is they managed to get together like a really broad coalition of community activists, people who had time, people who had money to make that happen and, and go through all of the hoops, um, you know, as required by the city. And so there's always an equity component to this, like what kinds of neighborhoods have the wherewithal to make this happen. And so if we're going to see this as a model going forward, there have to be ways for it to happen um, without requiring such a heavy lift from individual neighborhoods um, who, who may not all have the time and money to make this happen. Right, because it's often the case that um, pushing back against the car centric status quo requires local political capital, right? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes just even design know-how, like some of these open streets, um, you know, the, the cars keep trying to get in and they've been given these like really cheap metal police barriers and people have gotten together and made their own barriers that have planters on them that are movable platforms that have play pieces on them. And like that is a design change that actually makes a huge um, difference in how people see like the permanence that people can see. But again, that requires like time, money and know how and not everybody has the same amount of that. This is certainly true. Um, I was going to ask, though, whether there are positive lessons that people see, um, you know, in the urbanism world, uh, certainly the kind of the, all the controversies that we've touched on, or the tensions that we've touched on have been, you know, litigated over the last year. And I think there are um, some very legitimate um, complaints about the perceived progress of uh, how public spaces have changed this past year. But are there positive lessons? Uh, what have we seen over the last year and a half that would enable play to play a larger role in cities once again? Are there things that we can build on? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna, I'll answer that and, and kind of mix it a little bit with the, the discussion we were just having. Um, you know, I think, I think the existence of, it, certainly in the Toronto context, uh, restaurants in the streets is an incredible asset uh, to the vibrancy of our neighborhoods and communities, uh, obviously to the support of small business, and, and per per perhaps at least given my lens, um, uh, to dismantling the idea that streets are primarily for people to you know, drive through. And, and I do hope it stays. Um, and, and I do share, you know, the perspective that, you know, the, the role of commercialization in that um, but I also I also think that, and again, I have the view that play is an access point towards freedom. Um, I also feel that play is a, a threat to political and social orders. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you know the the perspective that a playground a playgrounds emerged as a tool for for children's safety. Uh, another perspective is playgrounds emerged as a tool to uh, to to tame adults um, and and create a paradigm that. Uh, uh, there are places for play and these places are isolated over here and that they are designed specifically for a certain age category to just embed in and reinforce the idea um, that play is not something that can happen everywhere and is for a certain segment of people. Um, so I, I actually think that uh, now to bring it back out to your question, I think um, the biggest it, most exciting thing I think I've, I've seen and that I have noticed from a, a city perspective that has been enabled this year is just the advent of the pop-ups. Um, there are pop-ups everywhere across the city. And, and I think the relaxing of, of um, those, who, um, who, those who are in charge of our spaces uh, to allow more popping up uh, activities has been incredible uh, in terms of creating a hotbed for creativity and, and new ideas to, to emerge, specifically those from an artistic and play perspective. Interesting. So allowing um, creative and commercial activity and the combination of those two to happen in ways that are quicker, cheaper, less heavily regulated has actually been a, a, positive, uh, a positive lesson. Yeah. Yeah. 
Good. Um, Tim, I wanted to ask you about um, the Summer of Play campaign. Um, and there have been a few things in North America along the same line that I don't think quite at the same scale. Um, what Can you tell us a little bit about what that was and your impressions of what we might learn from it? Sure. So um, the first thing to, to understand is uh, we're I'm speaking to you from a fragmented nation. Uh, we're really four nations now in the UK. And, and on this topic, things ran differently in, in, across the four nations. So in Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland, there was significant government money badged as, it may have been summer of fun, it may have been some other term, but it, but it was clearly badged as money for children uh, and families through the summer, uh, you know, basically as a kind of, Let's give, let's give some people who've had a really hard time a better time. Uh, in England, that was came through a campaign around food and access to food, and it was called holidays activi holiday activities and food. But the, the English government uh, actually couldn't get rid of all this money um, under that umbrella. So then fell back on community organisations and some municipalities that did have the wherewithal to, de to deliver programs, structured programs for kids and families and actually almost kind of co-opted the summer of fun hashtag. I see. And so it was, it was really interesting, um, uh, a kind of play, because in England, the government at a national level has been very uninterested, if not hostile to the idea of play. And this really goes back to the, uh, the, the, downturn and, and the change in government in around 2010 um, and and just a kind of retrenching and a shrinking of, of you know this sort of ambitions of the state um, and and we're beginning to see that changing a bit um, and we're you know uh, I, th I think as part of that uh, a more shall I say holistic take on what makes for a good childhood now that's very um, it, it, it's sort of small green shoots. <laughs> Um, and it may go nowhere because, you know, we're not working with a particularly strategic government right now. Um, but but the, I, I, certainly at the level of kind of um, the wider policy and public debate around children, I, th I really think there was a kind of an awakening of awareness around the importance of play at a really basic level that, you know, kids have had a terrible time, poor kids have had a particularly terrible time. Uh, let's do something nice for them. And of course, giving them space and time for play was part of that. Yeah. Where that goes, uh, it's really hard to say. The thing I found interesting about the public uh, discourse around parks and public space during the pandemic has been that it seems that for some people in North America, they've rediscovered the public realm. Right. This is particularly in the US. Um, there has been this sort of general attitude that, you know, the public, any public goods are, you know, if not undesirable, then assumed to be of low quality. And, you know, I think that may be changing. And one can imagine how that might link up to a number of other significant social and political changes that are coming, you know, the Green New Deal uh, and all the ideas associated with that being an obvious one. Um, do you get the sense, anyone, that um, spending time in public has changed people's adults' views of how we should interact, how we should as a society come together, whether even if it's hanging out and playing is in some way, um, has in some way a political valence to it? I mean, the question, I feel like that's almost two questions because I would say, yes, definitely. Like I live in New York City, I live in Brooklyn and um, the parks have been full. I feel like people who, you know, only got exercise in the gym before, you know, and were inside, like have embraced the parks, people are walking, like people are out there. That said, like, especially at different times during the pandemic, people have been out there, but they've been masked and they've just been with their immediate family. So I'm not always sure that like being out in the parks has actually led to more like interactions with strangers that help to build community. Um, but there is a sense of community in just seeing people out there and knowing that you are surrounded by people when sometimes, you know, especially in the winter, it, it felt like you were just like at home in your little box all of the time. 
Um, I mean, like the thing that I would hope comes from that is that, I mean, I happen to be lucky enough to live near like one of the marquee parks in New York City, Broken Bridge Park. But um, I think people in general kind of invested their time and attention at their neighborhood park. And I saw just much more focus on neighborhoods and going forward around the idea of play, I hope that this leads to kind of innovation in distributed play, um, which is something that's come up a lot. And like, that's one of the things that the open streets made possible to have play in places um, that had been under resourced before or you know had less set aside green space. So I, I feel like the future needs to be not like big marquee parks, but like lots of little small interventions. And I feel like, um, you know, like that's something that some of the other panelists are already working on. Thank you. Mitchell, what do you think? Is all of this spending time outside actually creating community? Will it? I think so. I, I think that in, in my particular community, it's highlighted the extent to which public spaces, parks in particular, um, offer like not just opportunities to play for children, but that there are meaningful connections that happen around that, right? And now the types of interact we're we're desperate for interactions and connections with other people, other grownups, please, other grownups, right? Yes. Um, and but it, I, what's really nice is that the the parks and the public spaces felt safe before restaurants or right like those opened up before a lot of the businesses and that meant that a lot of our interactions with other adults right would happen in these unstructured spaces and would therefore be unstructured right and that was really really nice we're not going to a dinner and a movie for a date because there is no dinner and there are no movies right but i'll meet you in the park and we'll do whatever. Um, and so all of the possibilities that are afforded to us through public spaces became started to leak into the possibilities of our interactions between people. That was my really, really rosy eyed view of it. it didn't always turn out like that. But I saw just a, enough of that to make me feel optimistic. Thank you. Um, I'm glad to know I'm not the only one who, you know, Saw something to uh, something to applaud and something to be uh, um, starry eyed about over the over the last year. Um, I actually wonder, Mitchell, if I can ask you another question um, that I wanted to get to about the connection between art and play. Um, you know, because your work really is, in some cases, is really right on that line. So, you know, what do you think that the connection is? And, and I guess has the sort of experience that you talked about changed the way in which you approach your work or the way in which you think uh, public art? Um, the role of public art can play in society. So um, I think that I, I think that public art will end up having something to say about this moment that we just experienced. Right, major traumatic moments in history mm -hmm. tend to become more memorialized or monumentalized through public art, and this was a big one. And this particular event is uniquely suited to be monumentalized through public art because it was a crisis that played out in our public spaces or that temporarily annihilated our public spaces or changed our notion of what was public. It changed our relationship to it. And so this is a conversation that we will have in public. All right. Um, and, and of course, at the same time, there have been a lot of conversations about what we monumentalize, et cetera, in our public spaces. And we're realizing more and more the importance of sort of peer to peer connections uh, in, 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 in the real world. Mm -hmm. I think that a good public art piece um, should embody these spirits like that we are talking about in terms of like a good public art piece is not instrumentalized, right? It is not also a bench or it is not also a widget. It is not also an iPhone charging station, right? It is something that like exists purely as an object of imagination that is really only instrumentalized by your own brain as it tries to come up with its own reason why this thing should exist. And so I, I hope that we invest more um, you know, in, 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 in public artworks, because the best ones do embody the spirit that we want for these spaces. Mm, nice. Um, let's go to Tim next. Um, and then maybe we can go around the table with this. Um, I wonder if expanding from public art to um, more generally, how might play, how might, excuse me, how might the experience of the pandemic change the way in which we play and the way in which we think of play? Um, what do you think the, the influence of this moment will be, uh, Tim? Well, I, I, one thing that I hope will happen is that, that um, 
that there's a, a myth has been busted. Um, and that myth is that we don't really need to worry about kids playing IRL anymore, um, you know, because they've got the digital world. And and that's not to underplay the importance of the digital world. And Alex is right that it's been 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 really important, but but it's not been enough. And we can see that we can see it in 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 the problems that are emerging in many families and with you know with with children who've not been able to see their friends, and um, and you know the the the, the loss of basic social contact, especially when schools were closed, that, that, that has hit children really hard. So I hope that, um, you know, so there's one way of, t of sort of, t of framing the question about what we now know about play or what we're maybe more aware of about play. And I, and I, I think that's, again, particularly true of the families in the most difficult circumstances, you know, so so with poor access to outdoor space or who, who, who are, you know, economically, um, uh, you know, in, uh, precarious. Um, the, the, so I, and, and in the UK, again, we have this interesting, it's a little more than a strap line at the moment, but it's, it, 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 it's called levelling up. And, and the idea is, you know, it's a recognition that there's a significant proportion of the population, even before the pandemic, that have been left behind by, really left behind, particularly economically, but also culturally. Um, and uh, that there needs to be a sort of big effort to level up those communities. And I... I nobody knows quite what that means, but I think it's it's. I, I hope that questions around the quality of public space, around you know just everyday experience of a good life in a neighbourhood, are part of that debate about what it means to live in a nice place and to you know have 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 a de um, a degree of kind of security um, in, in our lives. Um, whether I'm living in cloud cuckoo land is another matter. I hope not. Anyone else want to jump in? Yeah, <clears throat> I'll, I'll share a couple of things. One is, um, you know, I feel play is an antidote to our individual and our collective suffering. Um, I, I think that the pandemic has uh, exacerbated uh, you know, the, the word trauma has come up that, you know, exacerbated pain, suffering and struggle in so many ways. And, and many people have, have used play, whether or not intentionally or not, uh, as a means to, uh, as a medicine for that. And so I think, I think in many ways, the pandemic uh, uh, has facilitated more play, uh, albeit the circumstances by which it's facilitated it, uh, it by have been very challenging. But I think, I think we're going to see even more play as a response uh, towards uh, our ongoing challenges. And, and so that connects me to the second point, which is, you know, I mentioned earlier, um, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that I admire so much about play is that it, it, it can, it has the potential to transcend uh, our identities um, and, and to bring us together. And, um, you know, on the topic of community, uh, you know, we, we could, we often could find community, a community needs a home. A community needs some sort of place to come to, whether virtual or real. We exist at a time where even our most basic community, i.e. those people we live around, our neighbors, uh, we have been programmed in such a way that we, we don't know if we can fully trust them. Um, uh, in our own homes, we are having issues of trust. And so I think play as a tool for, for, for you know, bringing community, healthy communities back together um, is a necessary strategy at, at an individual level, at a community level, at a political level. Um, I think the less we have play, the more we'll see divisions. And, and we already are at a point where it feels like our divisions have, are at an all time high. So uh, I'm really, uh, and obviously biased, but quite bullish on the idea that we are creating more opportunities for play in order to bring uh, back connected society. Question from the audience here from uh, someone called Melissa. Uh, she's asking, I think this is a great question, um, and I'll turn this over to all of you. How would you convince adults how and why they should incorporate play into their lives, especially if they believe that they lack the time or the know-how, um, or they have experienced play as being commodified? So, you know, how do you um, talk adults into playing, and what might that look like? Um, I can go first. Um, just 
I give a lot of talks about the history of playgrounds and show a lot of photos typically of like all the different kind of amazing kinds of playgrounds there are that go way beyond the kind of like structures that you see, um, like plastic structures that you see. Um, and I typically get the question like, these look so fun, like why aren't they for adults? And I, and my general answer is just like, they could be for the adults. All you have to do is make it bigger. And I feel like that, like if the, the simple thing of kind of like scaling up the play equipment that we set out in cities um, as an invitation to adults um, would make a huge difference in the way um, adults feel empowered to play that like if there's a rope structure and you're the same height, you don't feel like that's for you. But if there's a rope structure that's like two stories tall, like that says, yes, like this is big enough for me to climb on it. Like, why don't I try it? Like, why can't I remember how to make my body work that way? And that's the kind of like loosening up that I think like leads to creativity and more ideas about, you know, doing more different kinds of activities in the city. Adult friendly play spaces. Huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I could sign up to that. And, and, and Alex has just reminded me, I'm, to be clear, I am most interested in, in, in the sort of play experiences of children. But I can think of some really nice examples of where exactly what, what Alex has described has been put into place. If I, trying to, you know, these huge swings that have been put into some public. I think there might have been one in Toronto. Um, uh, but say in, in my city, in, 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 you know, the Tate Modern, uh, the, the, the Carsten Holler slides, these enormous tubular slides that came down five stories um, and again a couple of years later a swing project I can't remember what the name of the outfit was that did the swing project hundreds of swings filling the turbine hall in 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 the UK's premier art institution um, and it was kind of joyous to see people of all ages and sizes playing on this stuff together I, 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 I so I, I think if you you know, maybe think in terms of the spectacular um, and the quirky, uh, then then that's a way to go. All right, well, um, I think that's actually a really good place to wind up, which is convenient since we are nearing the end of our time. So um, I just wanna thank all of you personally for, your, for this wonderful conversation. It's been really a lot of fun and I'll turn it back over to Alana. Thanks, Alex, and thanks to all of our panelists for today's fantastic conversation. Uh, the Bentway, our exploration into play began pre-pandemic because we really were seeing in real time that non-traditional spaces like the Bentway were necessitating us to think about new models of play. And I think as everybody here has stated, the pandemic has only put additional pressure on us to find these non-traditional spaces and to expand the opportunities within our public realm. And I hope that as we find these new activities, we'll continue to challenge ourselves to question the preconceptions and reservations that we have about play and, and who it's for. And I, I thank you all because you've given us a lot to think about. Though our, our season uh, playing in public comes to an end on September 26, this is uh, long gonna be a set of questions that we are going to delve um, headfirst into. So, so thank you very much. Uh, for anyone who's joining us today from Toronto, I hope that you have a chance to um, stop by the Bentway and the additional neighborhood sites in person before the exhibitions come to a close. Uh, seeing Nil Nil in person, for example, is an experience not to be missed. It's, it's truly mesmerizing. And for any of you who have children, it's uh, a little bit like stepping outside your own uh, body and looking back at the last year and a half reflected back to you. Um, so please don't miss the chance to see that in person. But for those of you who are dialing in from further away, I encourage you to visit our microsite, play.thebentway.ca, to learn more about the works that our collaborators have developed, to um, rewatch the first uh, in this, this series of conversations, and um, to see how all of our partners have challenged us to think about the new opportunities for play in this moment. So thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>